Hello, we'll be starting in just a minute. I hope you are ready to hear about cryptic crosswords because I'm ready to talk about cryptic crosswords and uh, and construct a cryptic crossword as well. Um, so just sit tight and I will start. I will get started basically at four this time. Okay, it is four o'clock. I am going to get started. Our second episode of Under Construction, I'll be talking about cryptic crosswords. Um, so last time I gave an introduction to the snake charmer and talked a little bit about how it came about and what it was like. And uh, I started to, to write that script for, the, for cryptic crosswords and it turned out to be, oh, I don't know, about 200 slides. Uh, so I'm cutting some of that out, uh, but we will go into the go straight into the introduction anyway. So we're talking about cryptic crosswords today. I was going to start off and talk about the history of the cryptic crossword. Too darn long. That was about 60 slides that I cut out. So I'll instead dive in with what is a cryptic crossword. Now I'm guessing that if you are interested in writing a cryptic crossword, you probably already know most mostly what a cryptic crossword is. But it's important to have some background for this uh, so, uh, that will come in handy later on. So the important aspect of a cryptic crossword is that a cryptic crossword has cryptic clues. Um, and this is what this is the chief difference between a cryptic crossword and say the crosswords that you will see in you know on weekdays in the New York Times and other outlets. And a cryptic clue means that there are two ways to arrive at the answer. Sometimes more, um, particularly in some British crossword, in some British clues, but usually two. There is a definition, which is like an American crossword clue. It, it, it usually indicates the meaning of the word. And wordplay, which indicates the letters or sounds that make up that word. This, in this way, each clue is sort of a miniature puzzle. You have to match both definition and wordplay together, and you have to figure out wh what part of a clue is the definition and what part is the wordplay as well. So even just figuring out what the clue is, is trying to say is a puzzle. And only one answer will match the definition of wordplay, usually. If you have a crossword clue like 20th century president, even if you know how many letters it is, there's probably three or four possibilities. With, uh, with most cryptic crossword clues, because you have this sort of cross-checking between the definition and the wordplay, there's usually only one answer. Sometimes uh, a clue may be ambiguous, because uh, possibly un unintentionally, if you are um, careful about how the wordplay, if you are a little bit um, loose with how the wordplay works. Sometimes you can deliberately construct a, a clue to have two different answers, which uh, is beyond the scope of this particular pr presentation, but cer certainly has been done. And cryptic clues follow certain principles. Um, cryptic clues were, uh, cryptic crosswords started in Britain uh, in around the, 19, the late 1920s, 1930s, and um, originally they were kind of uh, free form, but eventually certain principles started to be codified. Uh, the British constructor Afrit, uh, British constructors generally tend to go by pseudonyms, um, and they're also known as setters over there. You need not mean what you say, but you must say what you mean, which essentially means that um, although you may be misleading in, in how you construct your clue, once you have come across the right interpretation, 
it must, the answer must logically follow from that interpretation. You can't do something where, you know, you try to, um, you know, you can't have words doing double duty in certain ways. Uh, I'll get to that later. But that's, uh, that was one of the first codified principles. Uh, later on, there was a um, prominent constructor named Zimenes. I think that's how he's how his his pseudonym is pronounced, um, and he uh, was known for what is now known as Z uh, Zimenean or square dealing clues, uh, which has which um, famously have three. Uh, the the principle of those was famously. Uh, described by Zimini's successor as a, crypt a cryptic clue has three parts. The definition, the wordplay, and nothing else. And that was codified by uh, Zimini's successor, Azed. And um, not all British constructors follow the Ziminian guidelines. Um, some were particularly noted for doing um, unusual things that would not really fly by uh, Zimini's criteria. In the U.S., most, almost every constructor um, tries to be pretty square dealing. Um, some of them bend things a little bit, but usually it's within these guidelines. Um, so... The primary part of constructing a cryptic crossword, most of the work goes into writing the clues. And it will be important for us to keep in mind the options that we have for the wordplay. Because writing a definition is fairly straightforward. But if you have to combine definition and wordplay, here are some of the tools you can use for the wordplay. Uh, so common ones in cryptic crosswords include anagrams, such as actors to co-star. Um, each of these wordplay types usually has some sort of indicator to tell you to hint at the sort of wordplay that is going on, and uh, we'll get to that later. Charades, which is putting two or more words together. In this case, chart and reuse make chartreuse. Containers, you can put one word inside another, put die inside of grant, and you get gradient. Reversals. Um, taking a word and spelling it backwards, reward and drawer. Homophones, um, so one that um, I was reminded of a couple days ago when uh, Joshua Cosman, one of the cryptic constructors of the Nation mag magazine, had said, you know, I just noticed this, that cell phone and cell phone are homophones, and I had... Um, I had seen that one before, but it, but it was just brought to the surface by his remark. Um, now, homophones are a phonetic operation rather than a uh, orthographic operation. They operate on the sounds rather than the letters. Uh, one other ph major phonetic operation that is sometimes used that I did not include in here is the spoonerism, um, which is mostly used for multiple word phrases. Um, you know, like swapping letters and lopping sweaters. Uh, double definitions are often common. You know, many words ha in the English language have uh, more than one definition. So, for example, the word bill can mean a bird's beak. It can mean uh, an invoice that you send to someone. It can mean, it can be a nickname for William. And I'm sure there are others that I didn't even think of. Hidden words. Um, so you might have the phrase Disco Inferno and see that inside is the word coin between the, uh, the boundary of the two words. Deletions, in which you remove a word from a larger word. Now this is in some ways uh, analogous to the containers, but it's just the opposite. You know, if you have addition, you can have subtraction. And deletions can come in many forms. You can have, you know, in this case, I'm deleting a whole word from the interior of a longer word. It could have been deleted from the beginning or the end, in which case it's the reverse of a charade. It could have, I could have deleted a single letter, uh, which could be specified by, you know, deleting the first letter, the last letter, the very middle letter, a particular 
uh, letter of the alphabet that you specify. Um, it could be the first and last letter that you remove. There are many options for deletions. Um, we can have letter changes and letter swaps, um, such as starling to sterling, or in which the A goes to an E, or tenor to toner. Now, tenor to toner is technically an anagram, but you know, in this case, we could also express it as turn the E into an O and the O into an E. And because this is more specific than, an, than just rearrange the five letters of tenor to get toner, um, it sometimes has, can be used in situations where you wouldn't want to use an anagram. And I'll get to that later as well. Uh, letter selection. Uh, there are many phrases that will let you um, take a letter from a larger word. If you, say, if you say heart of glass, you might be referring to the Blondie song, or you might be referring to the letter A, which is the center of the word glass. Or being at odds could mean um, B-I-G, the odd letters in being. Um, all of the above, uh, the previous wordplay types, can be used in combination. And this is, uh, it's very rare that you've, that you find a, an entire puzzle that does not have a combination clue, because sometimes you'll have words that just can't be fit into a single one of the above categories. So, for example, taking we and the reversal of flower gives you werewolf. Um, some advanced wordplay types, uh, I say advanced in the sense that they're not frequently used in most cryptic crosswords, but they appear somewhere. Uh, letter banks are particularly... Uh, Joshua Cosman and Henri Picciato of The Nation are particularly fond of using these in, in some of their puzzles. Um, an example of a letter bank would be Schmier, which contains uh, the seven letters, none of which are repeated. If you then use those seven letters one or more times each and rearrange them, you can get cream cheese. Uh, Caesar Shift. Uh, a friend of mine who goes uh, who online goes by Gemini Six Ice likes to post um, occasional cryptic clues on his Twitter feed, and he will uh, often use uh, try to find unusual wordplay methods. Um, so one of the ones that he sometimes uses is a Caesar shift. Uh, some examples of that: if you take the word adder and shift each letter forward by one, you get beefs. If you have the word pecan and you shift each letter, in this case, I believe it's four spaces, four positions um, forward in the alphabet, you get the word tiger. So, also we'll need to keep in mind some of the uh, typical conventions that are applied to, um, to cryptic crosswords as we construct one. First, there's the grid. Now there are two main options for for the layout of a cryptic grid. First, there's block grids, which is the one that we'll be doing today. A block grid is sort of like a, uh, an American crossword grid in that the words are um, delineated by the presence of black squares. Uh, it is one main difference that it has from an American crossword grid is that you have a lot of black squares which um, make it so that some uh, letters are only used in one direction, or in other words, they're unchecked. In a block grid, we, want, we usually want to have one half to two thirds of the letters checked in each word. One half is pretty much an absolute minimum um, because they, you do want to give the solver the opportunity to um, have some letters in place from other words and give them a leg up in getting an answer. Um, but in particular, you always want you also want to have at least one unchecked letter per word. And the reason or one of the reasons for this is that for the solver, when they're solving it, if you're solving an American crossword in which everything is checked, you can look at all of the answers that are crossing a particular entry that you don't know and use them to, to figure out, that one thing you don't know, you know, assuming you know them all. And so it's possible 
to solve a crossword puzzle without having any idea what a particular clue means. In a cryptic crossword, you can get some help from some of the crossing letters, but at some point um, it is desired that the solver have to figure out every clue. Um, uh, because each clue is a little puzzle and um, certainly you can, you know, if you have three out of five, the first, third, and fifth letter of a five letter word, it may be that there's only one possibility for that word, but still it causes you to think about, well, how can I get this, this word to be an answer to this clue? Avoid consecutive unchecked letters. Um, this is not always followed, but is a good rule of thumb. Uh, again, uh, it helps you to make the uh, make give give a leg up to the solver. Most block grids are fifteen by fifteen, um, at least in American papers. Um, you might see larger ones f for special occasions. Um, in this program, we are going to do a smaller grid uh, because for time reasons. The other main kind of cryptic grid is a barred grid, which is usually used in, in what are called variety cryptics. Variety cryptics are, are beyond the scope of this episode. I would like to talk about them at a, at a later episode, but the, um, the essential feature of variety cryptics is that you're not just solving cryptic clues. You are then doing something with those answers. You might be transforming some of the answers to fit them in the grid. You might have to do some modifications to some of the clues before you can solve them. Um, there is, they're even more complicated than cryptic crosswords. I think they're a lot of fun, but um, they're not the place to start for this show. But in a barred grid, again, you want at least a half of the letters checked in each word. Um, ideally, you want at least one unchecked letter per word, but sometimes, depending on the particular gimmick that you are using in a, in a puzzle, uh, you might not be able to make a grid that has every answer, uh, that has at least one checked letter, unchecked letter in every answer. Uh, when I say a barred grid, I mean a grid where the boundaries between words, uh, there are no black squares in the grid usually, but the boundaries are indicated by thicker black lines or bars to indicate the start and end of each word. Again, avoid un consecutive unchecked letters. And in a barred grid, because there are no black squares, there are um, th there are more letters in the grid um, in relation to its overall size. So usually, uh, whereas we would do 15 by 15 for a block grid, a barred grid is usually 12 by 12. But again, one of the nice things about variety cryptics is the word variety, which means that sometimes you can do whatever the heck you want could be any size or shape. Um, I have seen variety cryptics that are on hexagonal grids, triangular grids, um, other things that, that don't really, uh, that you wouldn't even think to do in a, in a, uh, in a, in a normal puzzle, but in some ways you have a lot of freedom in a variety cryptic. The entries, you always want a three letter minimum um, Three-letter words should generally be uh, kept to a, kept to uh, don't use too many three-letter words. Some grids you might need a three-letter word to sort of connect two parts of a grid, or to fill in the space between uh, left by a longer entry. In a variety cryptic, you might have a hard time with a particular theme getting just four-letter words and higher, but. Uh, certainly don't go below three letters. Words, names, and phrases are fine. Um, in some variety cryptics, you might have more you might have more types of entries than that if you need to fill in things with your theme. But in our case, for a block cryptic, we want to avoid partials, words and phrases, words or multiple words that are part of a longer phrase but don't stand stand as a phrase on their own. Roman numerals, uncommon abbreviations. Um, again, 
sort of as we when we were talking about snake charmers la last time, the the whole idea here is to find interesting bits of wordplay and partials and Roman numerals and um, abbreviations that don't really stand on their own. Those are not, that's not so interesting um, for the sorts of wordplay that we're looking at. Um, but variety crosswords might have answers transformed into entries lacking dictionary nature. Um, I just solved a variety crossword in the Wall Street Journal by um, Emily Cox and Henry Rathvon in which certain letters that appeared in the grid or that would have appeared in, in the answers to the clues when you enter them into the grid wind up getting uh, the single letter gets turned into a whole word and as a result the entry is not uh, the entry that you write in the grid is not itself a word. And the most important thing that we need to consider for a uh, for a cryptic crossword in terms of the parameters and conventions are the clues. Um, some important principles: the reading, that is, how you parse the cryptic clue to actually solve it, should be grammatical and logical in the context of whatever wordplay and other things you are doing to the clue. Uh, one example of this is that some indicators only work for down clues. Uh, for example, in a down clue, you might use the word up to indicate that a word is being reversed. Because normally you would be writing it from the top down, but instead you write it from the bottom up. And um, some people may argue that similarly, if you're using left to mean a reversal, in an, uh, that that only applies to an across clue, but some people may argue, well, yeah, you enter the word top down, but if you're just writing it on paper, you would write it um, from left to right, so left still indicates a reversal. Uh, that's a stylistic difference. Um, I'm not going to um, rule on that one way or, the, or another at this point. The surface reading, that is, how the sentence, how the clue, which is not necessarily a sentence, but could be, uh, how the clue actually appears on the page to someone who hasn't solved the clue yet should be grammatical and plausible out of context. It doesn't need to be a true sentence, but it should at least feel like you could see it um, written in, some, in something that isn't a, crypt, a cryptic crossword. Maybe it would be a newspaper headline. You often see uh, clues that have sort of uh, clipped phrasing, dropping articles and basic verbs in headline style. That is often common. Or it could be something that you might see in a science fiction uh, in a science fiction novel. So it you know relates to things that are not true yet. Uh, but it should at least uh, make sense. Occasionally, you can take consecutive clues that that don't really stand on their own, and they may be connected with ellipses to improve the surface reading. I try not to do this myself. If if I am going to do this, I want the I want those two consecutive clues to really feel like they can go together as a single as a single sentence. You know, don't just say, oh, I've got, you know, clause A and clause B, and I, they can grammatically go together, but why why would you put one after the other, really? Um, let's see, next up. Oh, yes. Also includes uh, the enumerations should always be provided unless you're doing a variety puzzle or something where uh, you are um, where giving enumerations of the answers would give away information about whatever sort of answer transformation or other gimmick is going on. Um, the, at, at a minimum, you should give the length of the, of the answer and probably whether it is a single word or multiple words, 
but the precise amount of information that, that you give, whether it's hyphenated, whether it's, you know, do you say that out of this world is, uh, uh, hmm, now I need to count, three, two, four, five, or 15 or 14 letters and four words, that is, uh, that depends on style and sometimes uh, whether you're doing a block cryptic or a variety cryptic. Um, but if you're if you're not sure, you know, consult uh, the editors of the of a publication if you are submitting to a, to a publication, or ask around or use your own judgment. Um, one thing that you sometimes see in in cryptic crosswords is and lit clues. An and lit clue is a clue where the definition, uh, where the whole clue, can be read as both the definition on its own and the wordplay on its own. And often these clues are indicated uh, often by an exclamation point. And um, I have heard from some constructors that they feel like putting an ex exclamation point in there is sort of like um, bragging. Like, hey, look what I did. I made this work both ways. And I can see that as a... As a um, as a valid point, uh, but at the same time, I think that at least in American cryptic traditions, I would prefer that there be some explicit marker of an analyt clue. I think there are constructors who use question marks for their analytes instead of exclamation marks, which may be a little bit uh, less bragging. Um, either way, you do have to be careful. Uh, the solver still has to be aware that sometimes an exclamation point or a question mark might just be there because the, uh, the tone or grammatical function of the clue really is improved by having that punctuation at the end. If you have a clue whose surface reading is a question, then you'd want to put, it, put a question mark at the end. If you have a clue whose surface reading is very excited, maybe you want to put an exclamation point at the end. It doesn't mean it's an analyt clue, but certainly having an analyt clue that is unmarked is not as often done in American traditions. When you're writing clues, here are some things to watch out for. Indirect wordplay is uh, one of the particular things that um, that people that people are are warned about. In particular, there are some kinds of wordplay, um, most frequently anagrams, but also letter banks, which are related to to anagrams, and hidden words generally need explicit fodder. What that means is that if you're going to make an anagram of something, if you're going to say that. Uh, Cater is an anagram of react, and you have a clue for cater because cater is your entry, you better have the letters R-E-A-C-T there as opposed to, say, respond as a clue for react. Um, and the idea behind this is that there are, even if you know exactly what you are anagramming, in the case of a five-letter word, there are 120 possible anagrams. And if you say, well... First, I have to find a five-letter synonym of this word and then anagram it. You're adding an awful lot of uncertainty to something that was already somewhat uncertain to begin with. So, um, more generally than saying anagrams, letter banks, and hidden words need explicit fodder, I would say that deterministic wordplay types, that is, if you have some kind of wordplay going on, and you know what the constituent parts are, and there is only one way to put them together by your wordplay to get the answer, you can have more indirect reference. Um, and this operates on a continuum. Sometimes if you, have a, if you have a charade, one word after the other, you know, if you have chart and reuse, you smush them together, you can only get chartreuse. You might not recognize that it's chartreuse at first, but you will get the letters in chartreuse. If you are putting die inside grant, there's more than one place to put die within grant. 
It could start after the G, after the R, and so forth. But that's still only, in this case, four or five possibilities. Um, so the more leeway there is in interpreting the wordplay, the more explicit you should be in what you are putting together, and vice versa. Sometimes uh, another thing to avoid is recursive indirection. So you could have a actor Martin's son could mean Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen could mean C, as in the NATO alphabet Charlie, and Luster, as in Sheen, to mean cluster. But you can't use Mar actor Martin's son to mean Charlie Sheen, which gets transformed into cluster. Um, if you're going to do something that is based, a, sometimes I've seen things which are based around this idea of recursive indirection, like um, part of, you know, here is a clue. Inside the clue, I'm going to take this keyword in the clue and write a clue for that clue. And you have to figure out where the inner clue is and, and apply that and solve that, and then solve the outer clue. But that is a specific um, mechanic for a specific variant, and if you're just doing an ordinary cryptic, you should avoid that. Sometimes you get in trouble with the indicators. An indicator, an indicator is a word that you use to hint at the particular wordplay operation that is being used in a puzzle. First of all, can the re the indicator that you're using reasonably construed to do what you want it to? If you are using a, a charade, you want something that can indicate um, straightforward combination, juxtaposition, addition. Um, also, does the implied order of operations with your indicators make sense? Now, you can allow for punctuation changes in your clue. Sometimes punctuation is meant to be misleading. Um, and sometimes you sort of think about, well, I would need to put some implied uh, parentheses in place. Uh, one, uh, one clue that I, uh, one and lit clue that I wrote, not for a particular puzzle, just came up with it, was uh, Timeless Prank by Internet Provocateur, eight letters. Now, the answer to that was Rickroll, which the definition Timeless Prank by in Internet Provocateur, you know, it goes back to 2007 or so, but at this point, it's probably going to be at least as far as, as in relation to the timeline of the internet, it seems pretty timeless. But the wordplay was take the words trick for prank, and troll for internet provocateur, and remove the T's from both of them. Um, some people, you know, saw it and thought, okay, so I take the T off of trick and I get Rick, but then I still have troll, so that has an extra T. Um, so in this case, it's a question of what is the scope of the word timeless? You, um, which was used to indicate remove T's from, from the other words. Is your indicator double dipping? Um, you know, I'm not talking about and lit clues in which the whole clue is double dipping, but things like, yeah, um, are you using your indicator as also part of the fodder that it acts on? You know, if you're using uh, an example that was on Wikipedia was could be um, to um, indicate a possible anagram, and then be dry. It was like hat could be dry. Five letters could be is the indicator for an anagram, and it's working on be dry. Could on its own doesn't really make sense as an anagram indicator, even if you think that could be, could be. But having the word be 
um, appear as both the indicator and the fodder. Uh, it's something that violates that you must uh, mean what you say, or I forget which which order it was said, but um, it violates the uh, principle that Afrit laid out in one of the earlier slides. Not everything is an anagram indicator. I have fallen victim to this myself. I have written clues where I think, okay, I can just slap an adjective that sort of means not normal or bad or something like that and have it be an anagram indicator. No, anagram indicators should somehow talk about movement or change or um, something that is not the normal state of affairs, just saying that it's, say, evil is not, uh, does not really work as an anagram indicator. Unintended ambiguity. Sometimes you want ambiguity in a cryptic clue if you're, if you're doing a particular sort of puzzle, but you generally want your clues to have only one answer. A common source of unintended ambiguity is if you have a wordplay type which is symmetric. What I mean by symmetric is that in an, if you're, say, having an anagram, and your um, words are react and cater. Cater is an anagram of react. React is an anagram of cater. Anagram is actually not a good example here, now that I think of it, because in one case, you'll have to explicitly specify it. In the other case, you'll have to give a clue uh, for, the, for the definition in a wordplay, that is. But for reversals and homophones, you might have something where you have, you know, maybe you have stab and... You want to say that stab is a reversal of bats. So you have a um, synonym of, of stab, you know, strike with a knife or something like that, and then a word that means reversal, and then a, a definition of bats. What happens is that you, a solver might say, oh, I have this word that means stab and this thing that means reverse it. So I'm going to take stab and reverse it and get bats. Whereas you intended to have bats reverse to make stab. So the ways to get around that you can is to make the indicator unambiguously relate to the fodder. The easiest way to do that is by placing the indicator at at an extreme end of the clue and not smack in the dab smack dab between the definition and the fodder. Another possibility is to choose a particular indicator which um, can't really be construed to, to work the other way. But that can be tricky because sometimes word order is flexible. Uh, word salad. That is, um, often beginning constructors will say, well, gee, these cryptic clues just look like a bunch of words put together and you're supposed to interpret it. Um, forgetting that part of the goal is to make something that looks plausible. So the important thing here is, do the elements of the clue come together in the surface reading? That includes subject, verb, object, relationships, which covers everything from tense and number agreement to, if you have a transitive verb, what sort of an object can it take? You know, if, can, you, can you do this verb to a person? Can you do it to an object? Can you do it to an idea? The order of modifiers. Maybe you have a wordplay where you, um, you've come up with a way to, to take the letter R and a synonym for big and put them together and you found that it makes the name of boat. And so you say, okay, red big boat. That's not how English adjectives work. English adjectives have a specific order that they can go in and size comes before color. So big red boat is grammatical English. Red big boat is not. Just because you have um, parts of speech in the right places does not mean that the sentence is actually um, something that you could pl plausibly construct as English. And is the meaning plausible? That doesn't mean that it has to be true. It just means like, could you see this, this happening in some sort of um, alternate universe? Um, sometimes this has to do with if you are expressing a 
relationship between us um, a, a wordplay relationship you know you're putting one word inside another but that outer word is something where um, it doesn't make as an as a as a concept it doesn't make sense to put something inside it like you know you might say putting a house inside a um, a table and well you can put a table in a house but you can't put a house in a table one thing uh, one thing that you often see in British cryptics is the trope just the opposite so put table inside house just the opposite which means no we're actually going to put a house in a table but I don't want to say that out loud because that makes no sense is the clue grammatically meaningful um, what I mean is is the clue uh, the, the term I th that is used in linguistics is I believe a constituent phrase uh, and that means it does not need to be a f complete sentence but it needs to be something that has grammatical function on its own uh, there are certain combinations of words that might appear as a part of a larger thing but uh, out of context they don't really uh, they, they don't form a complete idea um, an example is, I guess, uh, one of the classic examples of titles that are not constituents is A Scanner Darkly. Um, because darkly, as uh, an adverb, does not apply to the noun phrase a scanner. I think it applies to, I guess, maybe the, the preposition through or something like that. Also, uh, definition of wordplay connection. Um, you can have words that come between the definition and the wordplay to make it uh, stick together better as on the surface. However, you need to be careful that it does not imply a particular relationship between the definition and the wordplay that is not there. There are basically three kinds of relationships you can have grammatically between the definition and the wordplay. There's a reflexive relationship. Uh, not reflection. Uh, there's the symmetric relationship. Something like definition is wordplay. You could also say wordplay is definition. Um, is is an example of a connector that functions in that way. Um, if you are saying definition from wordplay, that means you are getting this this thing that is referred to by the definition from these wordplay operations. But saying that you're getting these wordplay op operations from this thing um, doesn't really make logical sense in this, in this um, construction. Similarly, you can say that the wordplay makes whatever thing you are referring to by the definition. But you can't say that the definition makes the wordplay. These are not universally adhered to, but I have had editors tell me, you know, I'd prefer you find a different way to phrase this connector. It, it uh, doesn't really work to me. And so that's something you should keep in mind. Now we've gone through these pitfalls. Let's, let's um, put a positive spin on things and, tell, and I'll tell you what you can do to make your clues better. In any point in, in writing a clue, you should look for words with alternate meanings. Um, that is to say, you know, if you want to try to trick the solver into thinking that you're going a particular direction when you mean something else, using a word that has more than one definition is great. Um, it's especially great if your word can have alternate parts of speech or grammatical function. That can mean anything from bear being both an animal and a verb meaning to carry, or R-E-A-D, red, meaning a present tense verb or a past tense verb. Use a thesaurus or dictionary when you're trying to find these things, or both. Um, you know, a thesaurus will find you great alternate words to use. A dictionary will help you find um, different senses of word that you might not have thought of. Um, a thesaurus will usually t have entries for different senses of a word if they're, if they're common, but some of the less common senses might not appear in a thesaurus. 
uh, sometimes you need to resort to using bits and pieces to finish off a clue. Like you have, you know, you can make you can make this uh, your entry out of a couple words, but you have a couple letters left over. What do you do to get those couple letters? Um, the common things are abbreviations. You know, often I will just look up a letter, a single letter in the dictionary in Merriam-Webster, and it will say, here are the things that this is commonly an abbreviation for. Great. Um, abbreviations can also include, uh, common abbreviations include the NATO alphabet, uh, chemical element symbols, and state abbreviations. Those are, are very common sources of one and two letter chunks. You can also do letter selection. You know, we mentioned this before, phrases like head of state for the letter S, last in line for the letter E, burnt ends for the letters B and T. Play with modifiers to improve cohesion. Um, what this means is that sometimes I find that I'm writing a clue and the wordplay, you know, has something that ends in an, maybe the wordplay ends in an adverb. And the, um, and the definition is a noun. Now, I know from Schoolhouse Rock that an adverb can modify a verb, an adjective, or another adverb. It can't modify a noun. But if instead of defining, you know, maybe I have an uh, elephant, instead of just saying it's an animal, I could say it's a big animal. And now I can put that adverb that was in my, uh, that was in my wordplay before big elephant, and it works out. Um, so you can play with adjectives, adverbs, also participles or relative clauses. Uh, maybe you have a word play that really wants to um, be, that wants to come after a verb. But again, your definition is a noun. Um, you know, maybe instead of having tenor be clued by a singer, it could be clued by person who sings. And now sings can be followed by whatever wordplay you had that wanted to go with a verb. So keep these in mind. Above all, be interesting. And this is this has a lot of interpretations. Use interesting wordplay. Um, there's this um, there's this guideline that, that when you have a wordplay relation, you don't want to use words that are etymologically related in your wordplay. Um, but it can actually be okay. It's just, is it something that is um, surprising? Uh, an example that, uh, some examples that Cosman and Picciato gave in, in uh, their blog that accompanies the Nation Cross Cryptic, uh, I think they said that, uh, you know, using blind to mean unable to see, or as well as a structure that a hunter might hide in, you know, those those are pretty different in meaning, even though they come from, even though one is derived from the other. On the other hand, if you're, you have the word alewife, which is a kind of fish or a subway station in Boston, you could theoretically break it up as ale and wife, and those are not related to the etymology of alewife, but it's not particularly interesting. You see the word alewife and you, and you immediately jump, oh, that's ale and wife. Uh, one extension of, of etymological similarity can be okay is that you can use idiomatic expressions in different ways. It's particularly common in British crosswords to have a multi-word phrase that has an idiomatic definition, and then it is the wordplay is defining the, the words in that literally. Um, for instance, I saw uh, in a uh, one British cryptic, I saw the um the word the phrase play hard to get uh the word the definition was something like be coy and the word play was something like piece of theater that's obscure that is a play which is hard to get get meaning in this case understand they're still the exact same words but they're used in different ways use creative definitions um Sometimes, in a cryptic clue, since you have the wordplay supplied, you can get away with definitions that you would not really want to put in an ordinary crossword. You can go for an obscure sense of a word. 
you know, if you look at at a at a word like bill or duck, it may have five or six separate entries in the dictionary that are completely unrelated, and some of them you're like, I've never heard of that before. Go for it. You can be a little fast and loose, but not but within reason. Um, you know, you can underspecify a clue, for example. Um, and misdirection is a particularly important um, tool in a cryptic crossword writer's arsenal. And ways that you can, can get misdirection include uh, garden path clues with unexpected parsing. Um, in linguistics, a garden path sentence is one that sort of leads you to, in, to interpret it grammatically in one way, and then suddenly a word choice causes you to have to reevaluate how you were interpreting that sentence. Um, and you can do the same thing in cryptic clues, where the structure of it really makes it look like you are going to break it down in a particular way, but no, in fact, um, it's, you, have to, you have to parse it in a non-obvious manner. Subvert expectations. Um, some expectations that crossword that uh, solvers may have include obvious indicators, like, you know, oh, of course, in disarray is going to mean an anagram. Well, maybe it turns out that in disarray is the definition, or it is a uh, part of the fodder for a different part of wordplay. Or it's include means a, a a container or something like that. Um, fake crossword tropes. There are a lot of tropes that um, are that you often see in crosswords. You go, oh, this must mean that. Um, for example, if you see the word the letters F L O W E R, ordinarily pronounced flower. If you've solved a few cryptics, you learn to go, oh, I think they mean a river instead, a flower, something that flows. And so don't go for that. You know, fake them out. You know, have your flower be a flower, even though it looks like it's it's wanting to be a river. Or, uh, I mentioned just the opposite before. I, I have used just the opposite to actually mean, no, we are going to take this word and take an antonym of it, not to reverse the wordplay operation that is implied. <sighs> 50 minutes into this, I am getting into the constructing strategy. Whew. So, for a blank grid um, in a block-style cryptic, you know, we're going to start with a grid. We're going to start with blocks in the um, rows and wherever there is an even row and an even column. And we're going to add black squares symmetrically. And when we do that, we want to uh, allow for multiple answer, an an multiple answer lengths and open grid connections. The multiple answer length means not every answer needs to be the same length. It is more interesting if we have some short words, some middle, some medium words, and some longer words. Open grid connections means that there's always more than one way to get to a particular part of the grid. Uh, you know, you never want to have one part of the grid completely cut off from another because then it's basically two separate puzzles. But you also have want to have more than one way that you can get to a particular corner of the grid from the opposite corner, so that. Um, you, if you're stuck on a particular um, connection, you can try to solve your way in through a different connection. And as you're working, allow for some flexibility in the black square placement. Then fill the grid. Um, depending on what type of puzzle you're doing, you may want to start off start with thematic entries if you have some sort of theme or gimmick with some particularly prominent prominent entries, um, like one across if it's a long word, or any grid spanning entries, or difficult entries. Um, generally, longer entry if you don't have thematic entries, longer entries are going to also be difficult entries. So longer entries first. And when you have a long blank and you're trying to find an entry to fill it, choose entries that have good wordplay potential. A common trope among puzzle writers is that when people find out oh you write puzzles you write crossword puzzles do you write the grid do you write the grid first or the clues and if you actually think about it you go oh well how would, why would anyone think that of course you write the grid first with cross with cryptic crosswords sometimes you actually go oh i've got this idea for a clue or i've got this word that i see how i might clue it i want to put that word in a crossword make your job easier 
And then once you've placed your um, first entries in, see what entries are the most constrained. Um, look over your options for filling them and pick some, pick, you know, find one or two that have good wordplay potential and keep going. Repeat until filled. And uh, often if you have a shorter, especially with shorter words, you know, you might have a four or five letter word and you have two or three letters that are nailed down by the crossing entries, but that still gives you, I don't know, anywhere from two to 20 possible ways to complete it. If you have that kind of flexibility, keep an, keep an eye on that and um, for when you're cluing in case you get stuck. So now we have to write the clues. You know, consider your wordplay options for each entry. Um, I usually just sort of scan the, scan the word list once I've um, filled the grid and think about, well, what does this, what jumps out in these entries? Start wherever you get inspiration. You don't have to go from one across to uh, whatever number down. You can write clues in any order because you've already filled the grid. Now you just have to, uh, each of the clues is usually an independent puzzle. Think of a way to turn your wordplay equation into a clue. Um, choose definitions and indicators that will work together well together to make a an interesting clue. Polish the wording, and sometimes you'll go, "Oh, I I have I have this definition and wordplay indicators, and and I just can't quite make it work grammatically. It's it's like, you know." I've got, they're at two ends of a room and, and I can get them six inches apart, but I can't close the gap. Recognize when you're, when you're stuck like that and try a different approach. That can mean trying a different wordplay op option, or it can mean using the same wordplay, but with a different surface, or it can mean, um, can you change that entry? Which is what I talked about earlier with having some flexibility. Keep going. And remember, it's just a draft. You don't have to get all your clues perfect the first time. And you can totally do it. I believe in you. Once you've written the clues, we're finishing the hat, you want to lay out the grid. Um, there are many options for that. You can use crossword software. Um, I tend to use a table and a word processor because I don't use my crossword software often enough to know how to use it. Uh, if necessary, you can make a vector image. Uh, that is a if you have a square grid, I really would prefer that you use some kind of uh, crossword software or a table because those generally have more ex more options for accessibility. Um, you know, a crossword program can usually output the puzzle in something like JPUS or uh, a format that um, other software can read so that people can solve those puzzles online. If you're making a PDF, a table can, uh, is usually more friendly to a uh, screen reader than a vector image will be. Add the grid numbers and solution entries. Those, you know, if you're using crossword software, that's probably taken care of for, care of for you already. If you're using a word processor, well, you've got to add the numbers in yourself. Lay out the clues in the solution file. Again, same issues. Uh, in your solution file, you should include explanations of how the clues work. There are often shorthands for, you know, use this symbol to mean an anagram, use this symbol to mean a, a homophone, and so forth. Uh, you can learn those, but um, in general, you want to have explanations, particularly if you are submitting to uh, an, some other editor so that they can take a look at your clues and, and see, oh, okay, that's what you're trying to do. Does that actually work? Test and edit. And... Um, for a cryptic clue especially, you want somebody who has uh, experience with cryptic clues uh, because, you know, you want somebody who knows not just how to solve a cryptic clue, but how to evaluate a cryptic clue. Does the wordplay actually make sense? And, um, and listen to their feedback. If they say, this clue doesn't really work for me, um, here's what I think is going on. You don't have to necessarily change the clue. It could be that you know you explain to them, okay, this is my reading, and they just go, oh, I had forgotten about that def that possible definition of that word. Or they may go, okay, um, I still don't think that works. And at that point, you should say, well, okay, 
I should trust that they're having tr trouble trouble with this clue, that it doesn't really work. I should rewrite it. And then, of course, publisher submit. Wow, that was an hour. I was hoping it would be about 40 minutes. Now we're going to go and actually write a puzzle. Let me go over here. All right, here's my workspace. I have an 11 by 11 blank grid set up. Um, it has... Uh, so I have set in some conditional formatting. If the text contains a an octothorpe or a hash mark, then I will put in a black square. I will color that square black. Um, that gives me an easy way to um, add and remove black squares. You know, I I already added the uh, hash marks in these uh, in the even rows and columns, but I can also, if I wanted to, add another one up here, and it will automatically blacken that square. I've also said that if this text contains a question mark, that it should gray that square. Um, this will allow me to say, well, um, you know, maybe I want a black square here, maybe I want a white square, you know, it'll go gray. And then when I'm actually putting entries in, I can, I can decide which one I'm going to do. Um, that's about all the conditional formatting that I need for this. I'm not going to worry too much about uh, the other things that I had to worry about when I was making a snake charmer. I'm just going to go go ahead and use this now. Um, I had some ideas for what I wanted to do with the basic grid layout. Um, I wanted to, uh, you know, 11 by 11, it's not a 15 by 15 because 15 by 15 would take too long for me to do, and I'm already an hour in, so I'm glad I didn't do that. But... Um, with an 11 by 11 grid, you know, I don't want to do three letter entries. So if I'm breaking the whole 11 letter thing into two entries, I have two options. I can, um, for instance, for the top row, I could put, uh, I could break it here and have a four letter word and a six letter word. I could break it in the middle and have two five letter words separated by a square, or I could have a six letter word and a four letter word. So either way, I all of the entries in the rows that are, that have more than one entry are going to be four or five or six letters. That's, you know, those are all fairly short. Six is sort of medium, but four and five are definitely short. Um, I can have a whole entry that spans the entire row or column. That would be 11 letters. If I want to get something in between, what I have to do is add black squares at the beginning and or end of that row or column. And so I will go ahead and do some of that um, on the outside. Uh, the, so I am putting question marks in because I don't want to commit to putting to necessarily having a seven letter word in each of these outer um, rows and columns. But I want to, I, so again, graying out some of the squares. And we have in the top row, for example, we have seven letters that I really want to be uh, left blank. And then two letters on either, one letter on either side of that, one of those could potentially be blank. Both of them cannot. Because if they were both blank, we would have a nine letter entry with only four checked letters. That's less than half. So at least one of these gray letters must be blackened in. Um, and then I want to have some 11 letter words in the next two, in the next rows. Um, again, remember we're doing this symmetrically, so whatever you do to the first row also has to happen to the last row in reverse and so forth. So, uh, so the next rows and columns on, uh, in the grid, I'm just going to leave as they are as 11 letter words. Now in the middle, you know, we have now two rows and two columns in the middle. We have two possibilities. Uh, well, two or three possibilities. Um, notice when we're in the middle of the grid, uh, if we put a black square between two of the squares that have already been blackened, it's it forms a, uh, it blocks off, it, it makes two words in one direction, but does not affect the grid in the other direction. If we instead put a black square where there are uh, 
adjacent, you know, diagonally adjacent to four other black squares, it will block the words in both directions. And this, in one case, it will create a five-letter word and a five-letter word, or in general, odd-lettered odd words, usually in a, uh, in a typical grid layout. If we put it adjacent to all four, it will create a four-letter word and a six-letter word, a four-letter word and a six-letter word. It will make words with even numbers of letters. So sometimes you, you are thinking about, well, do I want an odd number of letters or an even number of letters in this part? Um, so we have a couple of options. We could do a couple of squares that are blocking both directions like this, in which case we have four letter word, four letter entries and six letter entries. We could do the same thing, but rotated so that we have six letter entries and four letter entries where we had four and six. Or we could have something where we have five letter entries in each direction. Offhand, I would say I would prefer the four and six letter ones because that's more variety of answer lengths. Um, you know, in this case, all eight of these answers in the middle are five letters. In the other two options, four were four letters and four were six letters. But I also don't want to commit to that yet. So I will... I will put some more question marks in the center. And once I have done some of the other entries, I will take a look at those and see, well, what can I, what do I want to do here? So I said that, that for our longer entries, we want to choose entries that have, um, that have good wordplay options. So what I'm going to do, uh, what I already did um, before this episode was I l went to Cot and I said, uh, show me some answers that uh, have good word op op that fit certain word play operations. Uh, the ones that I was thinking of in particular were I want with an eleven letter word you often were going to have a combination clue, but I didn't want it to be too many things in combination. So I said, all right, what if we have say uh, a container clue, one entry inside another, but one of those two entries was reversed. Uh, or what if we have a charade where um, you're putting um, one word after another, but but and then reverse one or both of those entries. And I came up with a few that I liked um, as possibilities, and I'm going to start by putting them in the two 11 letter rows. I can't put them in a row and a column necessarily because they then they would intersect and they might not have the same letter at the intersection. But I'm gonna put them in two rows and then see what I can do in the corresponding columns. So uh, the entries that I, that I liked uh, included a delivery van. Uh, let me make the font bigger here. Uh, delivery van. Um, I might have to go back and do the searches again. I liked ever. So delivery van was a reverse charade. Delivery van, if you reverse it, can be split into navy and reviled. I liked that. Um, I had some containers with partial reversals. One of them was ever and anon, which has veranda inside a reversal of none. Um... And now I am, oh, math, math, oh, what was the word? Oh, yes, mathematics. I was trying to remember how many letters it was, which could be thematic inside Sam reversed. Um, I'll, I can see if I have others that I, that I need, to, if I need to fall back on them, but I will start with these. Uh, Ever and Anon and mathematics are both partially reversed containers, so I'd, I don't want to use both of them. I, I like, which means that I should use delivery van somewhere. I like delivery van. Um, so if I look here, um, I'm going to experiment and put delivery. Uh, wait, why is it? Why is it blackening those? 
I did not authorize that. I need to check my conditional formatting. Let's try this. Okay, I have altered my conditional formatting so that it does not shade in words that actually have letters in them. Now I could put delivery van up top. Um, I will think about that. Let's see. Um, now up top, I guess Ever and on is nice because it's a phrase, but veranda is is a pretty hard word to clue and fit into a scent into a clue. So maybe I'll maybe I'll try mathematics to start. So I'll experiment with having them like this. Uh, and I want to make sure that I have options for the uh, two eleven letter columns that cross these two entries. Uh, so those will be the first things that I go to cop for. Uh, so on the left here, and if these don't work out, I will try swapping delivery and van and mathematics. And if that doesn't work, I will try putting in ever and anon instead of mathematics. Uh, so here we have, all right, 11 letter word, two letters, then T, then five letters, then L, then two more letters. So dot, dot, T, dot, not capital. L dot dot. Search. See what it gives me. Oh, that's a lot of words. I think that'll be fine. Let me see the other one. Uh, oops, wrong window. Uh, back to. Uh, the other one is two letters, then I, then five letters, then V, then two letters. So change these to I and V. Uh, we have 16 words. That's uh, enough that I want. That's small enough that I want to see what I have. Um, some of these are very British or things that I don't. Uh, hmm. Oops. What? Oh, oops. I accidentally went back. I. There are about. There are some entries that I like in here in terms of being word, words on their own, but they don't have good wordplay in them. For instance, joie de vivre. Um, one of the things that you have when you're writing a normal, when you're writing a, a, a crossword or variety crossword in the American style, is you go, oh, I can use a Q here, and uh, and, and that's awesome. Or, or other scrabbly letters. Often in a cryptic crossword, if you're not careful, that scrabbly letter will uh, make things very difficult for you. Um, so in this case, looking at, for example, Quicksilver, um, you've got um, that Q, you're either gonna break it up into Quick and Silver, which is not a very interesting uh, charade, or you're gonna have to do something with that Q in some other way, and that often really puts you in a bind. Um, now, it did, I forget whether this is a word. I'm looking at Quicksilver and going, well, if we have, a, is, Quacksilver is a word, right. One falsely playing possess a quack. Ooh. Uh, hmm. So Quacksilver is a word, but it's not very common. It's archaic and only has 44,000 hits in Google. Um, my, my thinking is, if I wanted to, I could do quack salver, but change the A's to I's. Um, initiatives, joie de vivre might have some possibilities, but other than some anagrams, I'm not seeing them. Uh, so I'm going to, or think it over. That's a, a thin kit. If I can come up with a way to disguise over, then think it over might work. 
Um, okay, so that's possible. But I want to try reversing these. Uh, if I re if I swap the positions of delivery van and mathematics, then I would have a V and an I. And I now have 90 words, so there's a good chance that that will work. And if I swap, uh, then the other one has L and T swapped. And that one has 153 answers. So those are both pretty, th those have more options. I think I like my, my chances better with those. So let's take that out, put delivery van up top and ah, no. What did I do? Oh, I put a T in there that doesn't belong. So now looking at this, I think most of the other crossings are going to be fine. The one that I'm concerned about is the on the left-hand column, D to M. Now remember, I have possible. I could put a letter before the D or after the M. I think it might. I might have to put a letter after the M. Let's see. Um, D one two three four five. So seven letter words starting with D ending in M. There are 18. Uh, they include some that are uh, like Dadaism, decorum, diagram that I can probably do things with. So, so that's not awful. Um, if I put another letter after the M, do I get more options? I have 24 options. Uh, let's see, some of them are just plurals of the answers I had before, doldrums, uh, down to, uh, no, stop that, downtime, down home, uh, I actually like the uh, options for uh, D to M, uh, D, starting with D and ending in M better, just to check if I put a letter before the D, we have a, oh, some things, addendum, but that's going to be hard, eh, addendum, idealism, well, that's maybe three words there that I would feel like putting in a, in a grid. So I think I'm probably going to, therefore, in the left and uh, right columns, make both of these black. Uh, I don't, I am not worried about a seven letter word beginning with N and ending with S. So now let's go to the 11 letter words that cross these. We have um, 11 letters uh, with an L and a T. Uh, that should be back here somewhere. Okay. Uh, uh. Okay, search for that. Uh, let me. I'm actually going to need to shrink this a little bit. I blew it up so you could see, but I didn't have quite enough space in here. So, alliterates. Cold-hearted. Uh, um, uh, delaminated. Deliberated. Uh, dilapidated. Gila monster. Uh, illuminated. <laughs> Some self words. I'm sort of glossing over these silhouettes, but that looks like a hard wordplay to get. Self starter. Um, hmm. Illustrator. Let's 
So I'm going over these and, and just thinking and seeing what I want to put in. Dilapidated looks nice because although it's not a single word, I can have something inside of dilated. Um, there are a few others that are like that. Delimit, uh, well, delimitated isn't a nice word, but delimitates maybe. Uh, so that would be imit, delimitate, uh, or del plus imitates. I don't know how common delimitate is as a word. I normally think of delimit. Or limitation. Two hundred seventy thousand. That's that's fine. Okay, so I will go with delimitates or dilapidates. D. Oh, what's gonna? Uh, I need to choose one. Well, let's see. I have a. Uh, I have a partially reversed container. I have a fully reversed charade. Um, I'll go with the lap, the lapidated, and if I get in trouble later, I'll change it. And then on the other side, we have the V and the I. I believe I still have that in the previous one. Yeah. So we have 90 possibilities here, adventuring, adversaries, which has Aries in it, but I don't know what to do about adverse. Um, Cavaliers, uh, could have another, oh, ooh. Diversifies. Um, hmm. Hmm. Love stories. Uh, Hopefully this will get faster as I go along. Uh, I think... Devastation might work. I could have like Diva and Station, but I, have a, I already have... Well, I should, I'm not gonna be too picky. Um, yeah, uh, just to move things along, I guess I will, like, Devastation could be Diva and Station. I'm not sure what, I mean, they both have the Asian ending. Uh, let me see. Devastate. Um, okay, devastate. Where is the origin? Okay, so I was wondering if it was going to be um, like diva plus stare, but it's no, it's d plus vastare. So devastation as diva and station is fine. Diva is, I think, uh, was that a Hindu? Uh, yeah, a divine being or god in Hinduism and Buddhism. Okay, I could see doing something with devastation and diva and station so i will put that here okay so let's now fill in the seven letter words uh again Looking at the letters that I have in place in the top row and bottom row, I think I'm going to have the most luck. Um, you know, it's easier for a word to begin with D than to have D in its second place. I already have a lot of 
de words though so maybe maybe I want to find another option so I don't have as many D's in here especially D especially D E as a prefix uh, Never end. Ooh, never ending. There's never ending story. Never ending could be even reversed and rending. Let's try that instead up here. All right. Now we have the seven letter words on either side here. And I'm not going to pay attention to the words in the central rows and columns yet, but I have an, I, I suspect that I'm going to want to go with five letter words there instead of four and six because some of these might wind up being hard to fill out in four or six letters. But I don't know yet. So let's see, we have seven letters D to N, seven letters D to M, seven letters D to G, seven letters N to S. That's, that's a lot of D words. All right, D, one, two, three, four, five, N. All right, a lot of good ones here. Um, see, I like. Uh, dungeon's another good uh, charade of Dung and Eon. And it's different from some of the other words in here. So I will put dungeon in here, see if I cause problems for myself there. Oh yeah, I said I was gonna blacken these squares. So, okay, I could put a, either of these, there's the N blank V blank, which could be four, four or five letters, E blank R blank. I, I think there will be possibilities for those um, so I'm not going to uh, fret about that. Then let's go to the left column, change the N to an M. Uh, not as many possibilities, but some. Let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, diagram... Diagram could be a hidden word, maybe. Um, uh, decorum. I mean, it's got decor in it. I don't know if those are related. Go to Merriam Webster just to find out. Also has deco and rum. Uh, deco and decor are going to be the same roots. So if decorum is something else, what is decorum? Decorous, okay. Da, 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 da. Uh, from beauty, decent. Uh, this might be a case where they're sufficiently different, but I'm still not pleased with it. Um, let me just see if I have something else I can do with with decorum to break it up. I could still have rum and uh, hmm, unsure. Uh, some of these might have anagrams. I I like to uh, limit the number of anagrams that I have, just because you don't want everything to be the same wordplay and. Anagrams are one of the sort of well at, at last last resorts we can find some words that some letters that are rearranged to this. Um, so I'll go. Let's see if diagram will will get me in trouble. Let's see. I'll have A and R. Could have Alps. Um, hmm. The A might be tough putting here. 
Um, I, I'll go with the quorum because I like the patterns of consonants and vowels better. And I'll come up with a way to clue it. Uh, we have D ending in G. That's going to be a lot because we have ing. 93. Do I want something that ends in ing? I already have never ending. Uh, let me see what does not have an I here. Not much. Day long. Demagogue, den hag, dish rag, dust bag. No, I don't like any of those. So it will end in ing. That's fine. Uh... Darling is a nice one. It, it uh, doesn't use ing as a gerund, at least not in modern usage. It might have derived from a gerund, I don't know. But that 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 looks like a good one, and I, I, I can probably come up with something for that. So let's go with darling. Uh, hmm. Oops. Make sure I know how to type. Although that's putting an, ah, putting an I at the end of a word. Will that be a problem? If it's a four-letter word, there's things like taxi and and Bali and Molly and Maxi and there there are some possibilities. If it's a five-letter or six-letter word, I'm not I'm less sure. It could be Safari, it could be Okapi. Uh, let's do four to six star a dot i. This is all words that are four to six letters long. So uh, we have a total of 122. Um, there are fewer that are five letters, uh, but still some. Um, okay, I, I, I will, I will, uh, go ahead and leave the I in for now. And nine, seven letters and ending in S. This will be a lot because, uh, let's see, in order to, let's let's say that I don't want to do a plural, so that's pretty much going to be either O-U-S or uh, S-S, so I'll search for this. Uh, well, uh, there are some of those words I'm definitely not using. Uh, Non-plus, noxious, uh, the X is going to get me in trouble. Uh, nucleus, nervous, uh, nitrous, mm. not feeling any of these words, so I guess I'll go with a plural. Uh, all right, I have a lot to choose from. Let, in this case, I'm going to just go back and make sure, all right, I, I don't want to put... Uh, just to make sure I don't get myself in trouble again. Uh, well, maybe I'll start thinking about the central words. So, I have a few in pretty much each of these uh, places that I have two letters already in place. There are possibilities for them being uh, four letters. If they're five letters or six letters, um, they're going to have to intersect with another letter going, another entry going the other way. Um, so, for example, if I have my uh, if I have my black squares in the going along the down right diagonal. Then I'll have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, six letter words there and there. Uh, I could, so, one thing that I'm now realizing, if I do, if, if instead of having the uh, four and six letters, if I had five letters everywhere,
then the f because each of these pairs of answers uh, intersects in one of these checked letters, I will have to um, have all of them checked, which is more of a constraint and might be harder to fill. I, yes, I could put more letters, eh, no, not there, uh, more checked letters in like this and avoid having to have anything cross-checked in there. But I, uh, that's, I don't want to have that many black squares. So I'm going to take this one out and this one out and this one out and this one out. Eh, oh wait, go back to having maybe two of these. Oops, and we also take out these two. So let me see if I have possibilities for these in um, the ones where I know all, all the letters. So if it is in the in this diagonal, then we have uh, R blank, D blank, something, and something going down to E blank R. So what I'm going to do is say A is a single letter, R dot D dot A dot dot A dot E dot R. Let's see, how many solutions does it have? 297, more than I was expecting. Uh, let me make sure that the words are okay. Rudy's is not something I want. Rudist, Rudder, uh, Rodeos, Rodent, Ridley, Ridges. Okay, so there, there are some possibilities there. Uh, if I did it the other way, I would have C dot P dot A dot N dot E V dot A dot. Uh, all right. What do you have for me this time? I have only 66. That is a lot more constrained. And also, I think I'll be in better shape if I have a four letter word ending in AI than a six letter word that has to check with something else. So I will go ahead and commit to a grid layout now. And with that in mind, I'm going to, well, the four letter words, those I can just leave blank at, at this point. Any two letters in them that make a word will not affect any of the other entries that have been placed, so I'm not going to think about them. I'm just going to go over here. The only other tough part is going to be this uh, getting the seven letter word from N to S and having the E to R uh, the the upper right basically. So let me maybe I will see what works in the ER in the, in, in uh, the crossing there and pick something to put in the third letter for the N word. So now we have E dot R dot A dot and dot A dot R dot dot. We don't know that last letter. I bet there will be a lot of solutions, but I don't know. Oh, that's a lot. Uh, let me go back to just the E dot R dot dot dot. <coughs> the six letter word with E and R. And all right, I'll start there uh, and trust that whatever I put in there will give me lots of nice choices. So there's errant, errata, errand. Um, errand has some possibilities. Europe, uh, earthy could be, a, well, I already have a lot of, of charades in here. So ear plus thigh is maybe not as interesting. Do I have any good containers? Uh, Mm, well, let's see. 
grass, egrets, any uh, reversals, um, enrage, enwrapped. There are some there are some nice words in here, but I, I'll um, guess I'll go. Maybe errand could be a hidden word, and then I'd have an N there. Does that work? Probably. Um, any? Ooh, Eureka. Is there anything I could do with Eureka? That's a nice, flavorful word. Um, huh. Staring at Eureka and, go, and, and drawing a blank. That K and the... No, that's that's and that's a lot of vowels and eh. sorry Eure sorry Eureka, not today. Uh, all right, let's go with errand or errant then. Um, I like errand slightly better, but it's not required. Uh, all right, so now we have n dot r dot something. It could be like snored or snared or snares or snores. Uh, do we have anything that's not a d or an s there? Well, let's just. Uh, Andrew is nice because it gives uh, has some possibilities. Uh, Let's see, if we have n dot n dot 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 s, does that give us anything? Oh, newsies. Can I do something with newsies? I, I like the, or newbies. And we put an i in a not difficult place. Uh, well, hmm. Let's go ahead and, and do another simultaneous search. A is one letter, dot n dot r dot a, a n dot a dot 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 s. And we have thousands of entries. 594, I lied. Um, so there are words with un. Un unwrap. Oh, none of those look terribly good. Snorts, snored. Various versions of snore and snark and things like that. Can inner inured intro Ingrid. I mean, Ingrid has a nice uh, has a nice uh, wordplay to it of in plus grid. Uh, nah, nah. In a row, gnar, gnarly, and something, entree. Oh, entree is nice. It's got a lot of vowels, but uh, en and tree, and then needles could be needless cut short. Let's do that. Oh, but blank n, blank l. I can think of two words off the top of my head, neither of them I like. Enol is a chemistry term that I just don't want people to have to remember which is which. So eh, let me see if there's anything else. They don't even have enol. Uh, anol is what, a dye? A shift base derived from an aromatic, what? Okay, it's also, uh, a given name, but the indigo shrub or the indigo dye obtained from the plant. That sounds better. Let's just see if there, that's listed here. A shift bay. Anil is worse than enol, but let me just see if it ha shows up in maybe Wikipedia has a better uh, citation. Okay, so we have given names, which are going to be hard. It's a genus. 
so I guess it's the name of the plant that the dye came from. Is it actually? Okay, that's enough. I'll, I'll let Anil be be uh, the indigo plant. Sometimes you have some entries that are a little bit more uh, less familiar. You know, it's kind of crossword ease, but uh, eh, it's 5.44. We need to get to clues soon. I'm doing it. So the other one that's going to be constrained is the intersection of RD and ER. I already checked that and saw that there were a lot of possibilities. Let it go back. So we have... Uh, let me see. Am I going to have more possibilities if I put a consonant at that intersection or a vowel? Probably a vowel. So let me just see. Uh, let's see. That stands for consonant dot e dot r. And there are 15. Uh, <laughs> a few are good, but let's put a vowel in there. And oh, not as many as I thought. Meteor, Meteor is nice. It has a, a, a charade, it has an anagram, and that's going to mean we have something like ridges or rudder. Um, we'll go with rudder for now, but that might change. And the remaining ones I'll fill in as I need to. All right, so here's the grid. I'm going to start writing clues. This is definitely going to go over two hours. If you want to uh, run off and do something else. I won't be upset, but I'm going to start writing clues so you can see the important part. Uh, so I'm going to make, I'm going to duplicate this, uh, this sheet, and I'm going to just now take this and make a word list. I have about 16 words in here, I think. Dungeon delivery van. P entree. Okay, I don't need it to be quite that big. Let's go down to 16. Uh, 16. Uh, entree, rudder, Arnell, mathematics, darling. Uh, so that's. Uh, and I'll I'll worry about the across versus down distinction when I get to it, but not yet. Uh, so one down is going to be dilapidated. Then NV errand never ending. Oh, I hadn't noticed that we have two uh, NVs there, so I'll need to be careful about what the uh, four letter word is so that it's not too similar. But NEVE on its own is a name. Uh, I'm not going to use NEV. Uh, never ending, then we have decorum, needles, uh, then going down further, we have meteor and meteor and blank A, blank I. All right, let me, let me hide the console so I have more room to show more entries at once. So I'm gonna first put uh, some wordplay opportunities in here. Dung plus Eon. Uh, Navy, Navy reviled reverse. Mm -hmm. CP could be anything. We have N plus tree. Uh, rudder could be ruddier. But, you know, rudder could also be redden or ridges or something. So, yeah, if I get stuck on rudder, I'll come back to it. 
Daniel short enough there's lots of possibilities I specifically chose mathematics to be uh, thema sim thematic in, in Sam backwards darling hmm don't know just yet maybe it's a hidden word cheddar lingerie don't worry I'm not I don't I'm not going to see if there is cheddar lingerie out there um, APID in dilated or lap what is lap 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 lapis lapidarium well I'm not gonna dwell too long on it Aaron could be ER plus Rand could be hidden never rending could be even reverse plus rending uh, decorum I didn't want to do something with decor but it could be like I don't know code anagram plus rum um, so that's an anagram of code which would have to be have code uh, be uh, um, explicitly specified rum can be uh, um, clued otherwise. A needless uh, meet plus or remote star here could also be a homophone of meteor. And yeah. so Let's just start working on clues and see how we can how we get with them. So navy reviled, um, so reviled being a ver you know either a a, a verb or, or a participle, it could be be like okay the navy is going to be an armed a part of the armed forces or something. Um, reviled would be spoke ill of, so we could have like. Um, Uh, so Navy, uh, let's just Pentagon branch spoke ill of um, civilian vehicle. And I'll put in the 83 there. Oh, uh, sorry. We need a reversal indicator. Spoke ill of. Um, so we could have recalled, you know, you recall a vehicle uh, of, um, you know, I don't want to use something that is particularly um, dull, like backwards in this case, but sometimes you, sometimes that works. Uh, I've spoke dull of, uh, let's say recalled, um, is there anything else? It, it feels like there should be something regressive. Um, reversible. Uh, there are there are websites that have. Um, oops, no. Let's go back to the other window. There are websites that have lists of indicators. Uh, uh, I sometimes go to Cryptopedia if I need to brainstorm for indicators. So I will do that. List of reversal indicators. Uh, spoke ill of. Backfiring, capsizing, contrary, uh, in retrospect, call, receive, retreating. Uh, retreating and revolutionary are, are both uh, good. Uh, retreating fits in an armed forces context. Retreating civilian vehicle eight three let's make this a little bit bigger so you can read it 16 uh, scroll over here I don't need the grid right now all right entree rudder mathematics um, 
and I might not get through all of these in one go, um, since it's our, almost two hours now. I uh, will see you at some point when I want to stop. So never ending would be a reversal of even plus rending. Um, so even could be level, could be um, smooth. Rending would be tearing. Um, never ending would be interminable. So interminable. I think I want to make see if there's a synonym of even that will give that can be uh, somehow a noun or or even reversed would be a noun. Um, because interminable is an adjective and I'd like it to go with noun. So let's see, even synonyms. And go to, uh, let's go to thesaurus.com. It's gonna have to give me a lot of different options. All right, flat uniform. Uh, possibly plain. Uh, calm, undisturbed, stable, peaceful, having no advantage, time, fair, impartial, square, no, no, still yet, balance, make smooth, match, hmm. So if we have something like interminable, what's going to make sense for interminable to modify? Interminable level, interminable match. Well, match maybe if you put it in a sports context. Uh, interminable square. Uh, I'll try match. Oops, keep going to that wrong window. All right, so interminable. I'm just gonna oops, make the whole column 16, please. All right, so interminable match. Um, Go back to reversal indicators. Uh, rolling, set back, set. Well, we also have tearing or rending, which could be tearing or breaking. Internal match. Internal match may be overturned. So what's a good synonym of rend? Just to see if I have internal match in return before uh, breaking, splitting, sundering. Break. Um, we could put disturb. We could put the the rending. Um, could say that it comes after. Uh, uh, Never ending, 
in. Interminable match. Hmm. Well, I'll come back to that. Um, Hmm. One of the things I'm thinking about with Erend, I need to see how, how the original was spelled. Is there's the end of the French president? Uh, is it one T or two? Mitterrand. Uh, Francois Mitterrand has two T's. Could do something with Mitterrand minus Mitt, although I don't. Uh, I only remember Mitterrand because he was the French president at the time that I first started paying attention to international politics. Um, I don't know if he is sufficiently remembered at this point. Uh, but it could be something like something random. Uh, Uh, so an errand is, you know, a chore or a trip to do a chore. Um, uh, so part of me wants to do, since I, I was already have MIT on the brain from thinking about how to spell Mitterrand, that I could do a reference to Random Hall at, at MIT, which of course means nothing to people outside of Boston, but I was just thinking about random as something to put Aaron to have Aaron to overlap with. Uh, needless, so needless needles is going to be easy. Short, unnecessary, um, and then a good definition of needles. Short, unnecessary. Um, a needle is a long, thin object. It's an item in a sewing kit. Uh, definition shouldn't be too hard. Uh, short, unnecessary. Um, I mean, styli is kind of really broadcasting it. Uh, uh, let's see, it could be a... A small sender instrument. It's a knitting needle. Ah. It's a compass needle. It's a pine needle. Why isn't pine needle on here? Oh, needle shaped leaf. Uh, if I was doing the clue in a different phrasing, I could use leaves as a uh, pretend it's a verb. Um, Well, let's just uh, be metal objects. All right. Um, short, unnecessary metal objects. Um, so, NL, I mean, we can do some short ones. Um, For meteor, well, I'm of two minds on, on meteor. One is I have the option to do a homophone clue. And since homophones are one of those that don't often come up, I like to take the opportunity to use them when I can. On the other hand, I like the connection of remote to a meteor being an object from outer space, which makes me think of an anagram of remote. Um, um, it 
but I might be able to find a uh, possibility for a homophone in one of the uh, shorter words that I haven't settled on yet. But also, 16 entries, I don't feel that bummed out if I don't have a homophone. So let's go with uh, uh, so something remote object in uh, let me get this right. I forgot the difference between all of the different meteor things. A meteor is yes. Okay. Uh, wait. Meteoroid. What? Okay. A meteor is entering is the visible a meteor is a shooting star okay as opposed to just some random rock in space that hasn't yet gotten to the atmosphere remote hmm So now I'm wondering about the aptness of remote, because remote re implies distance, but it's coming towards the Earth. So, uh, feels like I'm, feels like they're kind of pushing against each other, but I might be able to make it work. Remote, I could just say re remote object in the sky. Uh, so now I just need an indicator, so it could be, just be, strange remote object in the sky um uh or it could be like Remote, oh, sometimes I like doing the thing where remote moving light in the sky. Where uh, a meteor is a moving light in that it, you know, progresses. But in order to make the clue right, it has to just be light in the sky, which is still a valid clue for meteor, in my opinion. Um, You know, I might get a test solver or editor who disagrees with me, but that's what the testing and editing is for. I'm going to try this for now. Remote moving light in the sky. Um, so that's remote moving and then light in the sky. All right, what else have I got? Uh, dungeon. So, hmm, I was thinking of, like, dungeons are associated with, with punishment and, you know, they're unpleasant. And so dung and, and, a, and eon being a long time seemed appropriate. But I've got to make sure that the, the clue is still uh, family friendly. So something, an eon is a long time. Uh... Uh, I might be able to re uh, come up with a different wordplay if I had to. Um, let's see, rudder. At first, I thought that the I in ruddier was the central letter, and so I could do an easy, like, heartless or, or hollow sort of construction to turn ruddier into rudder, but instead, I would have to remove the letter I from ruddier. Um, but I, let me just see what else I have for r dot e dot t dot e dot. All right, redeem, red sea, ridges, Rodney. I have some possibilities. Uh, Uh, 
dilapidated. Um, Let's see, if I have decorum and I want to do it as an anagram of code and rum, I'd have something like cryptic code or strange code or the like, and then rum could be, um, you know, a spirit or something. Decorum is, you know, polite behavior or what is, what is the exact connotation of that? Uh, decorum is behavior, etiquette. Um, So you can have a code of etiquette, but but co the of there is in the wrong direction. Um, etiquette. So what are uh, protocol? Uh, convention. All right. Propriety, fitness, uh, good taste. Decency, form. Hmm. Convention. How would I des describe decorum? Guidelines, behavior. Um, so, I mean, code of etiquette makes sense. Does it make sense to say etiquette code? I don't, that feels wrong to me. has all the stuff about the etiquette of code review. Uh, the etiquette code, code etiquette, etiquette. Uh. Okay, some people say etiquette code. That's tw oh, 27,000. That's not great. Code of etiquette is 90,000, so maybe. Hmm. Going back to decorum. Let's see if Wikipedia has decorum. Decorum was a, huh, a principle of rhetoric. I never realized that. Okay. Uh, so it might be, that might be a code. Something about uh, I'm tr I have this vague thing where rum is a spirit and co it's like something where you're fault. Uh, I wanted to do like following the spirit rather than the letter or the letter rather than the spirit. But I think the spirit is following the, the code and not the code following the spirit. So, yeah. Um, hmm. So I'm just going to write some things down here. Um, So something code, strange code, spirit, and what was this? This was 
um, suitability or etiquette, um, propriety. Suitability or or uh, etiquette. Hmm. Uh, let's see. I oh, I haven't been noticing the chat. Uh, um. Oh shoot! I forgot to. How, why isn't the stereo working? I. That's, let me try this. I heard that the right ear wasn't hearing anything. I might have been broadcasting in stereo when I wasn't supposed to. Does this help? I'm now in mono. Uh, anyway, I'm going to do some low hanging fruit. Let's go with cape for this. And go with maybe C plus ape. Ooh, C is carbon and uh, ape is copy. So that is a, is a ready-made wordplay. Carbon copy. Um, normally you say a carbon copy of something else, but that wouldn't work in the direction of the wordplay. So I'm going to say like, Fashion, accessories, carbon copy. Um, I might rewrite that, maybe have some reference to like a, a superhero with a cape. But as it is now 6.15, this will do. Let's see. Uh, darling. L in daring, maybe. Uh, so a darling is a sweetheart. Um, so let's see. L can be lady. Lady embraced by bold. Sweetheart. Seven. I like that. Um, so I took the L in that is that lady can stand for and put it inside daring. Uh, all right. Uh, so entree. Uh, let me see if what what else did I. Entree, so I'm set on entree with the E there, so. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about how to link a tree to a main course, but course can have different meanings, so there's probably a way to get that done. All right, let's see. Anil can be a can be a um, anagram. It could be a simple charade of Anne plus Illinois. Uh, it could be a bits and pieces clue. It could be a uh, it could be a container. I think it said like Anil was like a Philippine name for indigo, which goes with Manila. Um, let me go back and look up Anil again. Anil Indigo. Indigo for a super close. Huh? Hmm. It's, it's native to the Americas, but 
Well, uh, let me just see what it says about indigo dye. Find aniline in here. Anil. Aniline. Aniline. Eh, not thrilled with anil at this point, but got a red clue for it. I can make a clue for it. All right. Um, so. Die source uh, found in Manila. Not the most challenging clue, but it works. Uh, root, rudder could also be D and rudder. We got a rigid. Well, ridges could be bridges. Uh, all right. Let's see. I'm up to seven clues. So one more and I'll be halfway done. That's nice. Um, Dung plus eon thematics. Thematic. What's the word for thematic? It's appropriate. It is germane. All right. American Uncle returns. Comprehending. Let me think of a good way to describe thematic. Because I wanted Sam going backwards. So Sam of Comprehending to a theme. Well, you don't even have. You don't even have any synonyms. It's just relating to a theme. Of course it's relating to a theme. That's what it means. Uh, let's see if I have thematic synonyms. Ugh, no, and I didn't even want it there. I wanted to put it up here. Thematic synonyms. The thesaurus tells me having a theme. What? Those don't sound at all like thematic. Thematic. Topical. I mean, that's what I think of. Like, this is a thematic thing, this is a topical. Okay, thematic. I I'm not buying this difference between these two. I'm buy, I think I can, I think I can use topical to mean thematic. Um, American Uncle returns, comprehending or taking in topical subject. Taking in topical school subject. All right, now I'm halfway through. Cool. I might be able to get this done in three hours after all. All right, so N blank, V blank can be Navy, it can be Nova. I think those are going to be the, the best options for that. So, Navy or Nova. I mean, there's the old, uh, um, I don't know how much of an urban, I mean, there's the Nova meaning no, does not go in Spanish, but I, I don't think I want to go into that much foreign language knowledge. But Nova is also the reversal of Avon. So 
not sure how to relate them because I think of a nova as being either a uh, exploding star or Northern Virginia Community College, which nobody who didn't grow up in the D.C. area is going to necessarily know, um, or the Northern Virginia area in general. Uh, nova... Oh, you're right, it's a TV series. That's... I could do that. Uh, let me just see about definitions, see if there's anything else I'm missing. Okay. All right, so... Um... So let's see, Nova on PBS was was a science program, I think. No, ah, Nova, Nova. Uh, television, what? There we go. All right. So PBS um, science series. Um, so um, let's go with Nova PBS. Series. Mm. Now, I almost could do like PBS series about English River for and say that about is a reversal indicator and English River is what it acts on, but this is one of those cases where it would be ambiguous because you could say PBS series about and have Nova be backwards to mean an English river. There might be some argument over whether about can can uh, mo modify in one direction or, or the other, but I'm not gonna use about. Um, or if I do use about, I'm gonna make sure it can only apply to the Eng English river. So PBS series, um, um, PBS series retro retrospective uh, no retrospective isn't a retrospective wouldn't be a, of a river but uh, something like that I'll go back to reversal indicators uh, hmm, hmm, um, Um, set back, take back, turn over. Which direction is this? Uh, this is a down entry. PBS series. So this is a down entry, so I could use something like up. PBS series. Um, English River going going uphill in PBS series. Uh, that could still that could still be ambiguous, um, but I have the basic idea on that one. I will come back to it if I uh, if I have time. Dilapidated is still I'm still mulling over that. I could do dated. I could do dilated. Uh, I still have some leftover letters that don't quite make words on their own. So I will have to consider that. 
Um, all right, that's the only really long one that I have. Oh, dungeon is a seven letter one. Okay, so I should still think about dungeon. Uh, and going down here, yeah, those. Oh, and I still need to write a, a clue for decorum. Strange. Um, Oh, spirit follows. I really wish that I could use of in this direction. Spirit follows cryptic code. I mean, code of etiquette could be a synonym for decorum, but again, that's double dipping using code as both the uh, fodder for an anagram and the definite and part of the definition. Um, script, spirit follows cryptic code. Um, errand meteor. All right, errand looks like a, it could be a hidden word. I always still haven't done entree. Um, course. Um, Oh, um, somebody commented, is it okay to have Navy as a part of the wordplay for delivery van and as an entry? And that's a good point. If, if I had if I had gone with Navy, I, that probably would have been a bad idea. And my hopefully my test solver would have caught it. Um, but I wound up with Nova, which is uh, which obviated that problem. Let's fill in those parts of the grid that I don't have yet. Eh, eh, eh. Okay, never ending. Interminable match. Overturned before uh I mean, it is possible that I break up rending into ren, the cartoon chihuahua and ding. But that just seems like it's kind of all over the place thematically. Before, oops, overturned. Uh, I'll just say breaking. It it is never ending. Let me see. Is never ending hyphenated? No, not never ending story. Don't. Autocomplete for me. Never ending. Uh, Mer Merriam Webster says it's hyphenated. That's usually my go to. Um, I will I will hyphenate it. Um, so in that case. Uh, I, I was doing full enumerations, so never ending will be five hyphen six. Uh, Nova, let's see what else we got. Hmm. So let me think about dungeon. There's Dungeons and Dragons, a prison cell. Uh, place so maybe something like 
um, place to hold a prisoner. Place to hold a captive. Something. Dung. A very long time. Um, I'm having a, tr a little bit of a pr problem with getting the dung to work in because either you're either you're kind of literal about it and have to be kind of clinical or you know you're figurative about it but you're using a, a word that I don't want to put in uh, in a crossword um, Place to hold a captive. Could be just filth. Um, no. Okay. Oh. Dung. Muck. Place to, okay, something repulsive, that works. Place to hold a place to hold Place to hold someone, or place to lock up. That 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 lets me be freer. Lock up someone or something repulsive. A very long time. Seven. That's dung and eon. All right. And now I'm at ten whole clues. One half clue and five clues that I still need to write. I'm gonna go back to uh, right here. Ridges could be bridges without the B. Um, Red C. Uh, hmm. I wonder if there's a good way to red C if you swap the two halves is seared, which has nothing to do with red or C. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way that I can specify that that uh, operation as a more sp while being more specific than just an anagram. If it were an anagram, I would have to um, spell out seared. Uh, let's see. Rodney could be Rod plus Yen backwards. Um, Uh, I'm gonna go to ridges here. I think that's gonna give me the best ridges. So um, so something indicating dropping the beginning off. So something about connections. Um, um, Since a bridge isn't like uh, since a bridge doesn't have since a bridge isn't an animal headless doesn't really make sense but there are, let me go and find some deletion indicators in Cryptopedia uh, all 
All right, we have letter deletion indicators. First letter, head off, heading off. Uh, unopened. Let's see, heading, I like heading off or unopened there, but there's also in the selection indicators, I think it tells me everything but the first letter. No, oh, never mind. Uh, so, uh, so let's see, unopened passages to uh, so I'm thinking here since we're already talking about like travel in terms of passages that I'm thinking of Ridge as a geographic feature so to a uh, how do I describe a ridge um, mountain ridge Um, I'll just say unopened passages to mountain crests to uh, unopened passages or passages don't Passages without le no. Unopened That might use some polish later on, but it's serviceable. Entree, main course, uh, course, course of, um, so I'm thinking that EN uh, could be the central letters of something. Um, so let's see, let's see if it's the center of a four letter word. Eh. Center of a four letter word, anything that goes with tree. Uh, not off the top of my head. Let's make it a six letter word. Hmm. Again, nothing jumps out. Uh, let me go back to four letter words. Um, I could have bent tree. Um, so. Let's see here. Let's go with um, print. 
principal course. Principal course from the heart. Uh, course is not what I want there. Heart of bent from the center of bent. from heart bent. Since I'm already spelling out the en somewhat explicitly in bent, I may want to come up with a definition of tree rather than spitting that out. Sometimes your clues are pretty straightforward. You know, the parts are all there and you just put them together. But uh, principal course. Or it could be a hidden word. Although then, then I would have, you know, principal course. Um, maybe all right. Principal. So something something something. Harvest. from linden trees. Um, let me just remember what is a linden. Okay, so. Uh, uh, all right, so something from linden trees. Restaurant offering coming from Linden Tree. Uh, what did I have for my previous uh, found in? I don't want found in again. Uh, ref. So linden trees is a two-word phrase that has entree in it. All right, so now I have, is that all of the across clues all done? Uh, all right, I have all the across clues. I have three clues to go. I can do this. I totally can. See, I even have to psych myself up. Four clues. I can still do that. All right. Errand shouldn't be too hard. Dilapidated is still giving me trouble. Let me see what possibilities I have for the AI. Dolly. Dot, dot, dot. Alright. Dolly. Molly. Maxi. Uh, Ronnie. Taxi. Hmm. Sorry. Sorry could be a. Sorry could be a homophone. I uh, trailed off there. Uh, so let's try sorry. So sorry could be, you know, in terms of being in a sorry state, you say something. Uh, so let's. Sorry definition. You know, it doesn't make sense for a sorry to be for a, a an Indian garment to be apologetic, 
but it could be uh, all right, it's not feeling so mournful sad inspiring pitiful pitiful okay okay so um, and in order to we could d d define sorry somewhat obliquely as a wrap which may not immediately uh, um, suggest clothing. Wrap. Um, disgust. Pitiful wrap. So I'm using disgust as the homophone clue. So sorry, sorry. So I do have a homophone after all. All right, spirit follows cryptic code. Um, maybe cryptic code. You know, or is a uh, fine. Uh, let me go back to decorum. It meant uh, I. Decorum, definition, etiquette, protocol. You know, protocol could, could just be fine by itself, actually. I, I, I think I'll just do code or protocol and see how that tests. Two to go. Errand and dilapidated. Hmm. I'm liking dated rather than dilated for dilapidated because dated could mean old or it could mean saw as in saw romantically and old is a is a word that has a lot uh, that fits nicely with with dilapidated being broken down or saw can mean to visually see something so uh both of those are fine um but what do i do with the rest of the word i can either put it as uh dilapa plus dated or i lapid inside dated uh and uh, looking at that, I either have to do an anagram of something that I don't think has a single word anagram, or I have to break it up into at least three part words. So let me think. Just, well, just as a see if Delapa uh, Delapa has any anagrams. Nope. Uh, let's go to Neutromatic and see if there are any good multi-word anagrams of dilapidated. Yes, dilapidated. Paid. Now dilated was oh, paid off. Most of these do not look great in terms of paid late. Did pay, no. You say did pay or paid, but not did paid. Uh, it did a pedal. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, phrases that have good um, thematic cohesion in here. Dated a lipid? Uh, no. Uh, dilated iPad? Oh, I forgot about iPad. Um, 
you'd have to switch you still have to anagram it um, Yeah, that's about all that that New Dramatics willing to give me for now. So maybe broken down, busted iPad. And then I have to do something with dilated. In unless I can come up with a different way of saying dilapidated that could go after widened. Updated. Mm -hmm. Synonyms. Batter, decay, NG. Uh, these are all, none of these can be nouns, unfortunately. Uh, Font already. Tacky, threadbare. Yeah. Um, so maybe Expanded for dilated. Expanded to include um, phony iPad. That's busted. That's Let's just say that's busted. Uh, that's eleven. That's uh, that's not a full sentence, but you could think of, you know, like a warranty program that's expanded to include a phony iPad that's busted. That 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 makes sense to me. It's not a full sentence, but I can see it standing on its own. Uh, so that that just leaves us with errand, which shouldn't have been hard. Um, so, uh, I'm, I've been reluctant to put it, to have it be air and and, because I feel like there's a connection there, but I could be, I could be worrying too much. Errand, etymology, because I think of like knight errant, and errant is out of place, and, uh, Arande, huh? An air. That is completely the opposite way I was expecting. I was expecting Aaron to be from Latin and air to be from English, uh, from Germanic, if at all. Uh, they may be related, but I, I'll. Okay. So error would be to make a mistake. Uh, errand, it could also be error runt. So um, so error. Um, 
error is make a mistake, but I want it to be uh, something that could be transitive if it goes with ant. Uh, get it wrong. Be incorrect. Miscalculate. Sin. Uh, errant. Errand, errant. Uh, all right, so. Screw up, or it could be er plus rant. Um, uh, well, it's three hours now. If you're still with me, thanks for thanks for sticking around. Uh, Errant. Um, emergency room complaint is off course, off. Errant. Let's say out of order. Six. Oh, misspelled that. All right, let me just go over these quickly. See if I'm happy with what I got. Dungeon, place to lock, lock up someone or something repulsive a very long time. I have an extra space in there, that's fine. Uh, Pentagon, Pentagon branch spoke ill of retreating civilian vehicle. Okay. Now, this is a case where um, before, I, when I had reversals of a single word, I didn't want to put the reversal indicator in the center, like with, with Nova and Avon. Um, but in this case, because it's a uh, two words put together and then reversed, Delivery van is a reasonable phrase. Navy reviled is not a is not a good dictionary entry, so you would have reason to choose delivery van. Fashion accessories, carbon copy. I might choose uh, uh, something instead of carbon if I'm talking about fashion accessories, but that's still serviceable. Restaurant offering coming from linden trees. Unopened passages to mountain features. Dye source found in Manila. American uncle returns taking in topical school subject. Lady embraced by bold sweetheart. Expanded to include phony iPad that's busted. English River going uphill in PBS series. Right. I think... I think this is serviceable. I'm not going to lay these out. I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to... Um, finish this off, but I have written the clues, and hopefully you have an idea of the decision process that I made in, in crafting these clues. So I will just uh, hop over to the chat and see if there are any other uh, errant incorrect hospital monologue. Oh yeah, that's that's more, that's sort of what I went with, different phrasing, but um, could have gone with that as well. All right, so I will just take a couple minutes to see if anyone who is uh, still, uh, still watching has any questions. Um, I am, um, I'll give it a couple minutes, 
Um, you can post your questions in chat, and if you catch me before I sign off, I will answer them. Um, I will, while, uh, while I'm winding down, mention that uh, I would I hope to be back in two weeks, but I am not 100% certain about that. Uh, next week, I am moving to a new apartment, so hopefully I will have time to get my uh, my streaming setup back in place. Uh, if that if I don't have it ready in two weeks, then I'm gonna bump it a, a week uh, until uh, well three weeks from now. I'm not remembering the exact dates. Um, let's see. Uh, any other questions before I go? All right. In that case, I'm going to sign off. This has been me talking about cryptic crosswords for a, a good three hours. Thank you for for uh, coming by to learn about writing cryptics. And uh, I'm not sure what uh, puzzle type I'll be doing next week. I, uh, I have some inklings, but I don't want to commit to one yet. So I will see you next time. Thank you for stopping by.